Welcome to Obscura Undead. I am Ian, aka Vamp Daddy, and this week I am bringing to you an interview with a lovely duo out of the lovely state of Massachusetts, my new home state. Uh, this is Ghost Painted Sky. I have David Strong and Lisa Wood here. Welcome. Hello. Hey. And welcome to Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm originally from New England, so yep. uh, being back in the area is really cool, and it's just really kind of amazing to see the goth scene uh, as strong as it is still going, you know, and it's good to see it very thriving here in the state. So yeah, definitely. You guys have a lot of good nights. Um, it almost seems like weekly there's events and a lot of shows coming through and, you know, there's, there's a couple of bands here, a couple of bands that I think are worth mentioning and talking about. And that's why I wanted to bring you guys on the show because I really enjoyed uh, what you're doing. I'm, I'm new to the party of ghost painted sky. So um, but what I have heard and seen, I really enjoyed, and I think it's worth sharing. So, well, thank you. Yes, thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you. We're honored yeah. to be here. Absolutely. So let's get into a little bit of a uh, history. If you could tell us uh, in your words, um, what is Ghost Painted Sky for you? Wow. I think we'll start off with David since okay. you've got more history and think that yeah, I'd like to hear that, what you have to say okay. about that. Well, Ghost Painted Sky originally started um, as a solo project of mine, actually, back in 2014. Um, I was coming off of some pretty bad years, uh, lost several friends um, who passed away far too early and uh, got divorced and my life was just chaos. And this is Ghost Painted Sky is kind of how I dealt with it. And, you know, the, the very first EP... Uh, self-titled is is pretty much where that went. It was actually originally going to be a full-length album, and I still haven't finished all the songs for it. Um, I don't know if I ever will, but that's where the first EP comes from, and that's kind of what was that's what the impetus for creating the project was. And so it's always pretty much been an outlet for you know just dealing with life and for catharsis and just kind of you know yeah. we we've both had some interesting lives i guess you could say and this is kind of our way of of dealing with the turmoil uh and processing it again and you know for cathartic release and just you know to to just kind of get something positive out of the experiences that we've had that were less than positive for the most part very right, definitely and I, and I do hear that coming through in the music um you know from what i've listened to which you know, as you had said, you've got, you know, several EPs. I counted five on Bandcamp and then you had a full length album, um, you know, and it, and it seems like you've I've noticed this progression of going from more uh, minimal wave or cold wave in your sound, which would have been accurate with you being solo. Uh, yeah. what, what made you decide to bring in another vocalist and start expanding out from being a solo act? Um. The original, uh, well, it, it's, there was actually an original live band back around 2015 where I was doing vocals mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the, like half the material from the Flightless full length uh, is from that and some of the early EPs from that era. And then, um, you know, Lisa and I met in 2014 and uh, eventually, a couple, several years later. Can't believe it's been that long. <laughs> yeah, d discovered um, that she has a great voice. And so we started working with that. Uh, Seeker on the Scars EP was the first song that you did vocals on. And from there, it's just kind of, she's taken over the, the vocal role pretty much. Uh, she's a much better voice than I do, <laughs> certainly. I actually want to comment on that. Um, so I, you know, when I, I, listening to the music and then seeing Lisa's performance live, um, it, this may sound kind of out of left field, you have a very distinct voice. It's it's a very good voice. It's it reminds me a lot of a combination of like Natalie Merchant from Ten Thousand Maniacs and oh. Katie Lang. So it's got this very rich, um, you know. It's it's very different because you're not just trying to like emulate like Susie or uh, you know, which is what the go to in the the scene seems to be is like every female or female femme presenting. Um, vocalist wants to be the next Susie you have created you have a very unique sound um do you have any training for that or how, how did that all come about singing was it just like I'm going to do it 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that as a giant compliment. Um, you know, to hear to hear someone with an, uh, an ear listening to a vocalist that says something other than, oh, that was great. You sound like Susie. You know, that's, right. <laughs> that's pretty amazing because I get that a lot. I think it might be the hair or, you know, but right. for the sound, that's pretty interesting that you say that. Um, and I, I, I have to comment on, <laughs> I'm always kind of like shy to say it, but uh, my, my background in singing was in the karaoke bar. Okay. So I started wrong off with that. Yeah. singing at karaoke bars and uh, winning karaoke contests. Um, and, but I was too shy to go up on stage, like in my mind, like a real stage. Mm -hmm. okay. But um, I, you know, I kept that under wraps for years and um, I met David and was singing in the car and we were singing to like Iris or something. <laughs> it was something like, you know, just on the radio and on his uh, MP3 or whatever. Yeah, yeah just on whatever on the iPod. Yeah. <laughs> and just started wailing. I think we were like going to a club or coming from a club. And he was really quiet. And I looked over and you're looking at me like, <laughs> whoa, like, where did that come from? <laughs> what? Wait a second. Like, do you want to sing? <laughs> And, you know, I'm like nervous and shaky and unsure of myself, but, but still the performer. Um, I'm a big, silly, dorky, funny person, as I'm sure you've, no you've noticed, like, <laughs> since we've met, you know. You have and a so great sense of humor. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, like, what could be better, though, than having a, a partner, a, a really serious, serious partner that has so much to say and then working with him to, to create this music that is very healing and cathartic for my pain too. So, mm -hmm. so we started on our journey. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so how is that process now? You know, there's the two of you and then in your live shows, you know, what, from what I got to see, uh, you had another guitarist and you had the violinist with you. Um, so, but what is the creative process now like for you now, you know, you went from pretty much, you know, you were the impetus behind the whole thing. Now there's the two of you. Do you, how, how, how does that work out? Do you put down the, the music first and then Lisa, you go in and write the lyrics, do you write the lyrics together? How, how does that work out? What's your process? Uh, we, I tend to still write the vast majority of the music, um, like on the ephemeral wake EP, the uh, Fallen Beauty song was was an old track of Mike's, the guitarist that we were playing with at that point. And he did all the guitar work on that. Um, but otherwise, I pretty much write all the music, really, or, or pretty close to it. Um, you know, here and there, somebody will contribute, a, you know, an additional part like Mike or, you know, um, we, we might. Like the uh, guitar prior, prior, prior yeah, to yeah, our live guitarist, whose name is also Michael. Mike, <laughs> so yeah, we have Mike. two Michaels. It's a little confusing. <laughs> So our prior guitarist we call Mike, mm -hmm. and then our uh, live guitarist that we have now is Michael. But um, yeah, so I so I tend to write the music, um, and then she usually comes up with kind of vocalizations, not quite fully formed lyrics yet, but vocal sounds that work over the music. Um, then we usually tweak it somewhat. You know how many times this, how many times that, you know, sort of thing. I and... call it my cocteau twin. <laughs> 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 so I'll come in and, and he'll have like a, a song structure laid out. And it's a lot of a fun. A rough one, a sketch. A really. sketch of one, like as in drawing, you just go in and like have a, a, an idea of something. And I'll come in and be like, and he's like, oh, great. <laughs> that's great. Let's turn that into this. And then it's like Play-Doh together. And we we mold it and shape it. And it's it's beautiful. Like the, that's the working perfect. process of it. Yeah, yeah we tend to great. collaborate on most of the lyrics. Um, some she writes, some I write, and but the the majority of what she's been singing is kind of a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. So okay, that's cool. So so now you've got this new single that came out almost a year ago, uh, "Corridors," right? And then um, we of course we just put that on the obscure on dead comp and um you know what what comes next with that it's, it sounds like you've got an album in the works you've got 
I know you've got some EPs and I did notice before I say what comes next, I noticed that you, uh, some of the tracks are saying not in its final form or, you know, like this is an early version of the song. Um, so this is really a two part, like what comes next? Because how, how, the first part is, is it comfortable releasing something that you know is not in its final form? And then oh. now <laughs> that's like putting, um, you know, like the, the cart before the horse, you know, the carriage before the horse instead of the horse before the carriage. And my leg how, how isn't it... in the nylons yet. Right. I'm like, not completely dressed yet. Wait. <laughs> so is it's going to be odd to, to kind of almost be like naked like that in front of people, you know, with, uh, to go to that final form. Um, so when does all that come to uh, ahead to the new album? Like when, when, when do we expect that to hit? with this there, there's a bit to unpack there <laughs> um it's funny with quarters uh, that's actually the second version of the song um that uh mike a prior live guitar player um who had you know played with us some and including in this in, on some studio recordings uh actually contributed a bit to that which i i think really changed the song in a way that i was really that i really appreciated um so that that became the current version of quarters um, so that was that was kind of a case. Uh, it was there, there was original form that was released that we were playing live and was also released on the uh, Darkness Calling compilation. Right, uh, I saw that. You're still not alone. Um, and uh, so, so you can kind of see a genesis there of, of the way this the song has kind of you know developed over over time. And uh, I think the same is going to be true for Fire and Flame. That that's the one I think you're referring to. That it's it, it's not necessarily its final version. Right. But we really like the energy that that version had. So we just kind of right. threw it out there. And, you know, there, there was a time that I used to do a lot of kind of, you know, freeform ambient and some noise music and stuff. So there's always an element of chance and, and just, you know, coincidence and just things happening as they will. So to a point, I'm a little comfortable with that. And also just knowing that, you know, things do develop and change and that songs, while they're not necessarily done, it's it's kind of a, a snapshot in time and it kind of mm -hmm. shows a different side of a song like it's you know say you know the cure has been releasing you know a bunch of for several for a number of years now a right. bunch of uh, you know outtakes <laughs> and demos and you get to see a different side of that song and this is kind of a a version of that in real time almost um so i think it's kind of interesting to see behind the curtain a bit you know maybe not too much you don't want to release something really that's just completely unfinished but right. something that at least has a feeling that you want it to capture, even if it's not completely finished sonically, I think still has an interesting value. Um, so that that's that's kind of the reason behind that. But it's it's going to go. Both those songs will be on the full length album that we're working on, along with a couple from the Ephemeral Wake EP, Ordinary Song and There Against the Wall, will be on there as well, um, plus four or five more at least um, that are that we're in various on stages of now. completion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of which we've been playing live called Kissing Lions. And uh, there's a couple more that are pretty close to done, but not quite there yet. And a couple that we're still working out the structures on. So we're hoping to have the, the next full length out. Maybe it'll be this year, but probably late spring, summer, optimistically. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, along with that, you know, I mentioned about the, the live setup. Um, you guys, you know, you, you brought in Michael for the live shows and you had a violinist, which is, you know, certainly within the scene, goth music, post-punk, like using um, classical or non-conventional instruments has definitely been a thing to experiment with and play with. What was the, um, what was your reasoning that you wanted to bring in a live violinist? What, what inspired you to do that? um aurora has that aurora is our violin player um mm -hmm. like and uh it's it's funny she and i were actually in a band together a number of years ago uh, called 12th and ever and um she played violin i played drums in that particular band and i've so i've, I've known her for a long time and and actually she was originally playing keyboards in the live lineup um of ghost painted sky back in 2015 or so and uh it just kind of progressed over time. And I, I asked her if she was interested in, in playing violin instead. She can't always make the shows further afield. She usually plays our New England shows when she can. When she can. 
uh, but she has a pretty busy schedule, so she can't always make them. So the violin is, is kind of nice because it's a nice bonus when we play live with her. Um, and yet then that way the, the keyboards can join the drums and the backing tracks and always be present. Right. And, you know, then the violin is just kind of a bonus when, when she's available. So it, it adds a nice boring. touch to the stage. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's, it's wonderful to have her along, but then last minute, you know, like we go touring or somewhere where she can't drive or, you know, it's, it's not like time to, yeah, it doesn't absolutely, it, you know, our, our sound doesn't absolutely need it. We can, it's kind of, uh, kind of fluid and it's, I, mm -hmm. I enjoy it. I enjoy what she's doing for that reason. Yeah. And that's yeah, it. It, 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 it oh, adds sorry. to the stage. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say like, it adds, <laughs> it really gives good. Um, it's, it's a nice addition to the stage. So. Yeah, definitely. Sure, yeah, yeah. And and I like a lot of the, the stuff she comes up with, and some of it will probably appear on the on some of the album versions of the tracks. Great. Um, well, I guess it kind of leads to touring. Like, what? So you've you've stayed mainly to New England. Um, I know when we we spoke, you would talk about maybe hopefully getting out to do um, like uh, Dead Souls Gothic Lounge in Indy. Um, do you have any other areas that you're looking to play in? Because I I will just say this, promoters, if you're watching, this <laughs> is a band to book. They are really good uh, live. They give a great show. Uh, good energy um so anyways continue <laughs> thank you yeah, yeah we want to get out there yeah We're ready to go <laughs> a lot of our shows thus far have been in new england um but we've you know we, we did go to indiana we played in bloomington at gala dance out there um as well as you know a stop in the pittsburgh area on the way out um this past year and the year before that we did a couple of shows in the carolinas so we've been making some kind of tentative forays you know out there a bit we'd definitely like to do more of that and kind of expand on that this past year was particularly it was tough to book i tried to get more shows around it but yeah it was everybody tough. was touring yeah. <laughs> so every yeah. like clubs were double booked or you know they had one date and we just couldn't make it that day so it was just you know there were there were a lot of issues you know with, with the post-covid era everybody just coming out and wanting to, to play live shows and you know so so this year i think we're going to try to make more of an effort to book something in advance and, you know, we definitely would like to travel more and, and, you know, expand that. We just enjoy traveling, if nothing else, and enjoy playing right. shows. So, it, you know, it, it just makes, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you are right. You know, there were a lot of bands touring, a lot of festivals going on, a lot of bands double booking themselves for a fest, two festivals in one weekend. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I saw that a couple of times. So I, I do understand what you're, you're saying. Um is there anywhere specifically you'd like to go to to play? What what's your dream destination to to play live at? Ooh. <laughs> really anywhere? Yeah, there's so many. Well, yeah. obviously the, the Treffen would be freaking lovely <laughs> in a dream. Yeah. But. In a dream. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Really. I mean, anywhere. anywhere really. You know, we'd we'd love to to go south to the west coast, anywhere in between. So, you know, basically wherever, wherever we can go and wherever we've got our caravan, <laughs> we've got this great big touring van that we throw all our stuff in and we just go. So nice. do you have any bands that um, you like playing with that could join you on a tour or that you could put a tour together with? I would actually love to go down to New Orleans and we've got some very dear friends Um Eric and Lee and okay. LV uh, of Palace of Tears. Palace of Tears, yeah. Um, they yeah. came up here in October and stayed with us in our home. Um, and they performed um, with Kalon Mikla, with Pilgrims of Yearning, um, with Kanga. It was a great show. Um, David DJs as DJ D Void. So he okay. was the DJ at that show. What a lot of fun that was. That was great. Nicole from Dark Spring, we mm -hmm. love you. Um, <laughs> We really, really appreciate our kids around town. You know, it's great. We would love to go down to New Orleans. So we've been yeah, talking I, with uh, for years and hopefully. Yeah. I missed that show actually by a week. We were up here. Oh. Um, we were house hunting at that <laughs> point. Yeah, it, it's and, uh, it sold out at, at some point. I'm not sure exactly how soon. But. And we were supposed to have Kalon Mikla in Tampa and they canceled that show. Oh no. So I missed them here in Boston because we were a week too early and oh. didn't get to see them in Tampa. 
but um you know palace of tears they definitely are a great band um i got to see them i dj for them uh with um solemn shapes and ships in oh, the night nice. yeah we and uh Jeep kids yeah they're they really nice shows, people yeah, Carolinas. Yeah. nice yeah they're good people great, yeah. great to work with yeah um yeah they definitely uh had a you know they have a very different sound from what a lot of bands bring palace of tears does and oh yeah so they they really it might be in fact uh my band that i'm in um the waning moon we're playing with them in um at the dark castle festival in kentucky in july oh, wow. so That's and nice. i think we're supposed to but i don't nothing's ink's not dried so i probably shouldn't say anything but uh, we may be playing with them in new orleans at some point as well so nice nice uh, but, yeah. is that a phone call what uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness it's obscura undead and they want us to go down to <laughs> well you know you really like uh and, and tampa you know i would say so um you know, there's really for our scene two promoters, and that's Communion After Dark and you know Obscure Undead. We we book a few shows here and there, but that we're not really in the line of booking bands. So we usually kind of refer everybody over to Communion After Dark, and um, of course they have like Absolution Fest, and they get all the bands in. So um, mm -hmm. you know, I can always put. That's neither here nor there. I can, we can talk <laughs> yeah. about that later. That's but, a private uh, conversation, really. Yeah. So. <laughs> That, but that's that's interesting though that you mentioned like Palace of Tears and touring with them. Um, and and they're you know you're looking at East Coast. Have you made any inroads on the West Coast of the U.S. or not thus far? No. Um, it's uh, it, so far it it's kind of been a little unattainable financially mm -hmm. for us. Um, but we absolutely would like to do so and are trying to figure out a way to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I I do know a few people out there, not a ton, uh, particularly in the Northwest, but. You know, that's definitely something that's in the cards at some point. It's just a matter of when and how we make it happen. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, what what comes next? And you know, you've got an album, you know, there's potential shows that, you know, that we were just talking about. Um, what What is next? You know, do you do you have more work lined up after this album as creatively? I know sometimes there's burnout and sometimes there's like I've got four albums worth of material sitting here. <laughs> We're somewhere in between, I think. Yeah, <laughs> we um, we definitely have. I mean, our, our focus right now is finishing this album. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there's a full album of material that I never released that some of which isn't quite finished um, from the early days, which may be, may or may not become a side project. I'm not sure how I'm going to approach that yet. Um, so there's definitely like an album and a half's worth of that. And then beyond the album we're working on, you know, the actual Ghost Painted Sky mm -hmm. album, the, the second full length. Um, there's at least an EP's worth of material and possibly more. Um, we're also toying a bit with the idea of coming up with a bit more of a portable live show um, that may be a bit more electronic just to make it easier to do live as a duo. Um, we'll see how that turns out. <laughs> For now, we're still focused on, on playing, you know, as a full band. Uh, whenever possible but I mean we're, we're kind of playing with different ideas and different approaches just to you know just to suit the different kind of one inspirations we have but also um, different situations we may find ourselves in so you know there's definitely going to be a, a second full-length album that's what we're really focused on right now there's there's more shows in the works we we're already talking about a couple um, for the spring and summer uh, we're going to take at least a couple months off uh, from playing live, you know, to actually, you know, just have some downtime first and foremost, but also to to work on the, the second album and try to finish the songs that aren't quite complete yet. And the recordings of of all of the remaining songs for the album. Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay. But we're not putting away the idea also if we were to have someone say, you know, can you do this show? Um even if it's in the middle of the winter and we're in the middle of recording, yeah, um, I would drop everything. D depending so, on 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 depending on what and where, where it is, is and everything. And, yeah. yeah, it's the it, being in New England. Details, right? The winter is a crapshoot. <laughs> as far is. as you never know when a show is going to get canceled. It's happened before, um, so it makes us a bit reluctant. We're we're actually a couple hours outside of Boston, um, so you know, for us sometimes Boston just gets rain, we get snow and ice, and it makes for a treacherous drive. So. 
we try to avoid doing too much in the winter, but you know, depending on what things are, we're, we're always interested in, in shows and we try mm. to make whatever we can uh, happen. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's in the winter time, it can be tricky in new England, but especially outside of the region, it's, you know, could be something that could happen. But in the meantime, we're pretty much just focused on the recording and writing process um, at least for a couple months <laughs> and just having some downtime. We've, we've had a, a busy several months which is great we want you know to be mm -hmm. busy with especially with the band um but it, it's also good to have a little bit of time off to rest and recharge and actually you know create and work on some material all right, all right. sometimes that downtime is where you get your best introspection absolutely you know <laughs> because you're kind of forced to be within your own thoughts and yep yeah you know, yep. and that can be good and bad so i think the catharsis that you're talking about um, I think putting it into your music is a really, really positive way to do it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I'm paraphrasing, hey, but I've read a quote somewhere to the effect of like boredom is the mother of creation or something. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> so. Wow. So now comes the fun parts that we were talking about before. Um, some goofy questions for you. This is always interesting. So uh, you know, like I said, we've done questions about tacos and I thought, let's kind of go with the food thing. Uh, what kind of, what is your favorite role of spring roll, winter roll, or summer roll? If you were to have a, like at an Asian restaurant. I don't know. Would that be like deep, a winter roll? I'm asking him, what's a winter roll? Would that be like a deep fried egg roll? You'd just get at your like local um, joint, you know, I don't like know. a winter I, I, roll. Autumn roll Cause I've, I, I, you know, usually I see spring or summer rolls. Right, right. But I have seen autumn rolls and I have heard of winter rolls. I've never seen it on a menu, never, though. Yeah, I've That's never intriguing. seen it either. Yeah. Hmm. We're definitely uh, fans of spring rolls, vegetable spring rolls. <laughs> and do you well, like we're, them we're, fried? We're, or... I'm pesca and you're, you're yeah, vegan. vegan, yeah. So we'll start with that. <laughs> so my options are limited. But... <laughs> so he's vegan oh, no. and um, I was vegetarian for years um, and I'm pescatarian now. But like when we go out, for dinner, um, you know, of course, we'll sit down and we'll order stuff that we both like. So we'll usually get a spring roll because we can both eat it. So I would have to mm -hmm. say spring rolls. <laughs> That's my vote. Agreed. Nice. And I concur. Okay. <laughs> spring you need roll a is bell, good. like ding, <laughs> when ding. you're done with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm not going to ask you any any alien questions um, because we kind of covered that a little bit. It would be kind of curious. So now, now that the answers that you were giving back, like if, if there was one city that you've been to, which city would you think would be most likely to be abducted by aliens in? What city do we think that like, if we went to, we would, be, would be most likely to be abducted aliens? by aliens. Yeah. I, I honestly, I, I was like, Oh, New York. Cause no one would know, but like, then no, it would have to be like Montana and <laughs> the woods. Yeah, right. Right. I was then no one would even see the damn thing flying overhead. I was initially yeah. yeah. I was initially thinking Las Vegas because you go by the you know area fifty one. Area fifty one government right. area. Yeah, the, the extraterrestrial highway and everything. But then I was thinking like somewhere like West Virginia would probably be <laughs> more well, likely to where something yeah. like that would actually happen. No. But West Virginia's Mothman territory. It is. It is. Yeah. And, but there were UFOs seen in conjunction with the Mothman. Yeah. As far as I understand. Right. Right. So <laughs> West Virginia. That, that 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 tracks because there's like nothing there but like <laughs> right right like charleston like there's like one town and then everything yeah. else is just oh, like of any UFOs, real size with yeah. the ufos at least like play banjo sounds or any <laughs> but they do it on like a synthesizer be like synthesizer warning, banjo sound. like warning warning, warning, warning. <laughs> yeah be like the uh, you're not prepared encounters yeah be like close encounters versus like dueling banjos wow Oh, cool. my God. All right. One final question. It's a music one. There's an MMA fight and it's Robert Smith versus Peter Murphy. Who wins? <laughs> wow. At this point, I don't know. I mean, them now? Because yeah, at that's, any that's, point. That's true. That's a good question. Them, them now or we, back we in, the, in the 80s? We definitely need to know or, like, what's like... <laughs> or late 70s for them. Yeah. Or 90s. Maybe. <laughs> Have they been working out at the gym? <laughs> hmm. I feel like it would they'd be I, like... I, I, I want to... I want to say Robert Smith by default, because I think that Peter Murphy's, it seems like his health hasn't been very good in recent years. I, it seems like he had 
some kind of issue not long ago. <laughs> yeah, he well, I'm he not, had to, I don't mean to just Peter Murphy, but it right, seems like he canceled he tours. And... He got a cure though, and he he was up there for like something like he has four hours. Robert Smith has stamina. We couldn't believe it. <laughs> so I, I guess Robert Smith sure. for that reason. Yeah, he has he has stamina. <laughs> and Peter he, Murphy he can go the distance. All right, yeah, that, that's very good. So yeah. I, I guess that would be the answer. And I didn't mean any hate on West Virginia, by the way. <laughs> no, no. I, I know people that live in West Virginia, it's and I very think rural, they feel so. the same. You know people down there. The too, same way, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's very rural, and it and it's a it's a it's the kind of place where you expect to encounter something supernatural. I mean, at least I'm right. like, going like, through. That's there. what I said. Like the Mothman, they they have like a yeah. whole festival yeah. there and everything every year, and you know. Yeah. Maybe parts of rural Kentucky, or like she said, Montana or Idaho, or some someplace very out there, very woodsy and far away yeah. from well, cities. That I would suspect would be. But see, but that's when weird that. things can happen because nobody's looking. Well, exactly. Like, hey, stop well, that! <laughs> close encounters wasn't the was it the Devil's Tower? Where's yeah. that at? Isn't that like mm. the one of the Dakotas oh, or Wyoming. something? It's Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah, yeah. So like, there right. years ago. It was really cool. <laughs> I didn't see any UFOs though. <laughs> no. So, but but Devil Tower no abduction so story. Really cool. on this if you're ever in the neighborhood, check it out. <laughs> yeah. No abduction stories on this episode, unfortunately. No, I, I have none. <laughs> Thankfully, I'll say I've never actually seen a UFO. I think it would kind of spook me if I had, but <laughs> I think ghosts. I think, ghosts. I think I've actually seen weird ghost ghosts. Stuff, I've seen but... weird things, but yeah, not UFOs. So, <laughs> so speaking of ghosts, that's part of the name of your band so how did you come up with ghost painted sky it, well it's an interesting story it's actually um the bass player for the band i mentioned earlier 12th and never it was actually something that he came up with um his name was ron by the way um and he uh we were going to use it for an ep it never got used for anything and when i was trying to come up with a name for this project it just kept coming back to me it was just it just was, was perfect you know it, it had that kind of feeling of you're haunted by things that are kind of, you know, maybe not inexpressible, but that are kind of floating in the ether. And that that's kind of, it just kept coming back to me and kept coming back to me. So finally I asked him, you know, can I use that name since we never used it? And he was gracious enough to say, yes, that's, that's cool. Um, so thanks to Ron Miles for evermore. <laughs> cool. um, it, it just really fits what we do perfectly. I think. So yeah. Very cool. Ron has that's a Ron. Ron plays uh, metal, doom metal in particular, um, and his band is Faces of Bayon for doom metal people out there. <laughs> if you want to check them out, it's it's very interesting. You know the the crossover between you get a lot of people that are metal, um, you know, like like the goth scene in particular. Just seems to like it feels like we kind of grab in everybody that just doesn't fit anywhere else so like yeah. you could be a metalhead but you're like yeah i don't quite fit in in the metalhead crowd yep and goth is like come on in like what can you give us yeah. musically totally. or, that's know, how i got into it myself i was just gonna say in my early how, teens that's yeah how we got into yeah. it you know i was a metalhead in high <laughs> yep. school yeah i was i was a i was a, a thrash metal skater kid then i got really into death metal and then i found industrial and goth and it was like i'm home well, <laughs> yeah. and i was about to say then you've got like the computer nerds that are like you know i really like electronics and and those kind of sounds and they come in and then suddenly you've got like a whole synth wave part of yeah. the scene mm -hmm. and, absolutely you know, people adding that into it and um you know the the art crowd that of course like that it's kind of the backbone, I feel like, of the goth scene. Like the, the art yeah. kids, they bring their own elements to it. And, um, yeah. yep. you know, it's really kind of interesting. So that's kind of wild to know, like, that you guys both came out of the, I don't want to say came out of the metal scene, but, you know, as younger years, you were metalheads. And, yeah. Um, and, and I always found myself, you know, where I grew up, there wasn't, uh, um, there weren't any goth kids, and goth wasn't even a label right. at that point. Right. Um, We'd have to either go into Boston or, or actually, you know, where I grew up, I, I lived in Central Mass. Um, and to actually meet other goths, I'd either have to go into Boston or come out to Western Mass out here. There was there's a, a college town called Northampton um, where, you know, there was like a small goth crew that <laughs> I was yeah, kind yeah. of associated with for a little a short time. And, you know, this is and I was in South Florida on the West Coast it was very conservative, very Christian. And you had like jocks. And they were the overwhelming majority. And then any alternative kids, um, you know, we all kind of banded together 
with the, the band geeks, the metalheads, the Dungeons and Dragons kids, the goth alternative kids that were, you know, crying over the Smiths. And we all kind of <laughs> totally, you know, you I used know. to get bottles thrown at me out of yeah, cars same. just walking down the street because my head was shaved. Yep. And I was like 17 with a with a giant mohawk and a, a leather jacket walking the streets of Taunton, Mass. <laughs> I'm not going to say what year, but <laughs> a little before you. Yeah. And um, it, it was really brutal. And you learned to like tuck your head down and walk fast. Oh, yeah. And you weren't proud of being goth. You tried to hide who you were. Right. You weren't proud of being the freak or the weirdo. You had to hide that from, from everyday society. And that's what I love about the scene and nowadays where we feel like we can we're a little more emboldened to be ourselves. I mean, I don't know about you, but I walk in the supermarket now and people don't really give me a second look. Yeah. Well, Same. In fact, we've found people complimenting us yeah. on and our looks, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's a yes. different world. <laughs> yes. I've, you, I can't tell you how I many I love your boots. You know, those are some wicked rad boots or your hair is crazy. I love it. You know, yeah. I used to get I shit to wear boots up to my knees, to right. my skirts or whatever. And it, yeah, it was, it was a bad scene then, but, things are totally different now and it's 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 interesting <laughs> it is really interesting yeah so that kind of you know and on a final thought on this um you know i've been kind of trying to put more energy social media wise into looking at stuff in like tiktok and um you know i've been mainly facebook which is for you know like 40 and older people which is where i mainly <laughs> hang out at and instagram and you know looking at tiktok and we know there's like this huge eighties resurgence that's been going on for quite a while. And it seems like it hasn't died out quite oh, yet. Yeah, yeah. And it, and the, and it, when I say resurgence, it's, you know, I meet a lot of younger people either in their early twenties or teens that wish that they could live back in the eighties. <laughs> they um, didn't know the real eighties. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, sorry, you wouldn't have your cell phone or, you know, Computers were a dream in a house. Watch out for that bottle whipping past your head if you got a shaved head. Watch out. And, and it was also right. less, you, you know, duck. the cure and more Phil Collins from what I remember. It was, right? They, they yeah. think like, you know, like you, you never heard the cure on the radio yeah. unless it was college radio. I think what maybe right. Love Song got on the, the radio and that was about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so with that, you, you guys describe your sound as, you know, very heavily 80s influenced. Um, are, 80s and 90s 80s and 90s but yeah. are you you know I can only speak for the one show that I went to but the shows that you've done have you seen more of a younger crowd coming out to those shows you know it, it's interesting and this is actually a conversation that I've had with with different people over time um, we see a lot of them at the clubs when we go out you know X-Mortis yeah. is a really big night in New yeah. England in the Boston area and now Man Ray yeah and now Man Ray's reopening tonight tonight is actually the <laughs> opening night for Man Ray what I, yeah. I think oh, it, yeah, but it, it's, okay, it's a I'm very pissed. like exclusive private event, you know, okay. to start off with. But you know, as time goes going forward, well, they it's... had to. There was like three thousand people on the roster that wanted to come in, and they have like a a certain amount. I think it's like a hundred something people. I mean, it's a fire code, you know. I didn't even see anything. No, of course, I'm going off of Facebook. yeah. I, I don't I even think it's officially before. open yet. I think it's a kind of a pre-opening. Well, so, we yeah. I'm not really we clear. Went, on. Yeah, we went to Corrosion last mm -hmm. weekend. And I was really impressed with the, the crowd being younger. Yeah. That was there. And of course yeah. it helps. You've got a lot of colleges, right. in that and universities right, right all around it, but, but, it, but that's it's why more, I ask. Yeah. Know, it, it's more than that though. Um, because there were years where, where it was, you know, say in the early 20 teens, even through the mid 20 teens where you'd go out and it was like, I mean, there were 30 people in a club, you know, even, even at X Mortis, they would have like, you know, it would be bigger than 30 people, but it would still be a lot smaller than it is now. So it's definitely grown a lot, you know, in the past number of years. Um, but the interesting thing about that is it, it's mainly the club nights and only certain ones. And I haven't really seen too much spillover into live shows yet. So, I mean, we're hoping that kind of happens as time goes on. And I'm not sure what the disconnect is. I mean, there's, there's kind of always been a disconnect in New England, especially in the Boston area between live shows and club nights. It's kind of two separate crowds. There is a little crossover, but not a ton. Um, I, so we, we see that, that in Tampa well, as I well. Could, I could comment on that, actually. I know the answers. 
I have them. So listen. And lightness. So I, I with, wonder if it's the same answer I have. So go I ahead. bet you it is. I bet you it is. So as being a club kid myself and a live music appreciator and have gone to both. Um, one of the complaints I had back in the day when I went to see a live show is that it wasn't there was no like dancey space. There was no DJ. So you go into a club and it's just the sound guy, thankfully, throwing on a CD of his choice. And we all kind of just stand around like waiting for the band. Yeah, you drinks and you wait around for the band. Nowadays, what's happening, not like I, I was born 900 years ago, but it seems like lately uh, I see DJs are being put into live shows. And that's one thing I appreciate about Dark Spring and what Definitely. Nicole did. Uh, that show was amazing. Um, we brought DJ Devoid in, Nicole did, and he spun some sick, sick stuff. Like I was dancing. There were people actually dancing off to the side in between. But it, it was also a sold out show. So it's kind of hard to dance in that environment too. So, but yeah, Dark Spring in particular definitely gets a, a shout out for uh, having, you know, really good DJs at most of their shows. Angel does a lot of them too. Mm. Um, so yeah. I, I, I went, uh, Seraph, yeah. Seraph. Seraph, yeah. My my theory is this. So we we were doing the same thing in Tampa and we've had the same issues where the club kids are not coming to shows um, or as much, you know, you, you get a few that come, but it's not like overwhelmingly the, but then they the leave main... and go to the club after right. the show. Right. Sometimes. So my, and, and we were, and as a DJ as well, like, you know, I've DJed several shows down there, quite a few. And um, that is a newer thing because I can remember where it was, they throw a mix on, you know, either they put a CD in or they'd have a local radio station or whatever. But what I think is happening is that a lot of the clubs are not playing a lot of the bands that are coming into town. They're mm -hmm. sticking to the classics. They're sticking yep. to right. more electronic dance music as opposed yep. to, you know, they might throw in something by Susie or the cure or, you know, like one of those classics, but they're not playing yeah. these newer the, bands coming in. <laughs> right. So, I, I see that you know, too, definitely. Yes, yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. When we were at Corrosion last weekend, we saw somebody wearing a Boot Blacks t-shirt and an actor's t-shirt. And it was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, that's really cool. And yet they weren't being played there. Yeah. So Cor when those bands come to town, to be more of, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, when those bands come to town, the kids that are at that show, you know, those bands, they're not going to know who those bands are. Yeah. Corrosion does tend to be more of an industrial night. Uh, at least in my experience, I mean, they do play a, a variety, but it, they, they're definitely more focused on industrial, uh, at least, you know, in my experience when I've been there. Um, but yeah, there's there's definitely a disconnect and it gets worse the further you get from Boston, I think. So there there's a lot of smaller nights around that definitely stick to the tried and true and very rarely will pull out newer things. And you've DJed these shows, so you know it firsthand. And we've in, gone in clubs, together. Yeah. Um, and I understand, you know, you want to keep your 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 home crowd, your regulars happy. But at the same yep. time, I think there's room to introduce some new things. And I, I personally would definitely like to see more of that. And I mean, yeah. this is this is, again, kind of more pre COVID information. So maybe things have changed somewhat since then, because I mm -hmm. haven't really been going to clubs. Uh, you know, I, so I mean, I, yeah, just a little tentative with the whole, you know, thing with with the. COVID. I, I don't know. I don't know about up here, but I know like for Florida, like, of course, our state pretty much almost immediately everything was open in back in Florida. Um, but what we would see, you know, as the shows are happening, it was like, you know, you'd get your tried and true people that'll come out for the bands that are really into the bands and the music. Um, but the club scene kids were not showing up. And I, and a lot of that, like until the DJs would start playing those bands that were coming through mm -hmm. because the kids didn't know it people were not just the kids, right. but the people, right. you know, anybody going like, yeah. just didn't yeah. know the music. I don't want to, I don't want to um, infantilize any of the audience listening. Or yeah, watching. I, I just generically use kids myself to mean like basically yeah. anybody. Who's I, I, I use it to refer to people even like like I call, I'm so I, used call to every, I, I, call, I call us kids and everybody around me. <laughs> right, so. right. Because yeah. I'm in that mentality like '90s club kids, you know. Yeah, same. Of, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so that's what you were, no matter what. You were just right. But um, <laughs> but I I didn't know you know because like I I do think there's an audience for what you guys are doing. And I absolutely do see younger people interested in the kind of music that you're making. Um, so now the trick is, is getting 
you know, there, there's that fine line of like, no, I want to be obscure and avant-garde and on the edge of what the scene is doing. But there's also a, hey, like, I want people to recognize my my artistry and what I've produced. Yeah. Yeah. So um, any DJs that might be watching, I would highly encourage you to check out Ghost Painted Sky uh, and and really any of these yes. smaller yeah, acts are out you. there. So, um, well, we have spent a bit of time here now, and I just <laughs> want to say thank you both for um joining in and and chatting with us about who you are and and mothman and aliens and, and <laughs> spring roll so All the fun stuff. <laughs> thank you so much for having us yeah thank you very thank you it was a thank lot of fun for... yeah definitely